Welcome to the IBM Podcast Network. Is it the end of the road for IT in India? Should we celebrate the dismissal of the Pakistan Prime Minister as a victory for democracy? Will the recent rate cut boost economic growth in India? All of this and more on this episode of the Pragati Podcast. Hi. You're listening to the Pragati Podcast and I'm your host Hamsini Hariharan. Every fortnight on the show we discuss policy, politics and economics. So today in the first half I'll be sitting down with Anupam Manur, my colleague from the Takshashila Institution, to talk about inflation in Pakistan and everything else we've been reading. Hi Anupam. Hi Hamsini. Uh let me also just uh, warn you here that uh, this is a very unpopular move to get an economist to speak about inflation and monetary policy committee. <laughs> yeah, well that's what we've been reading so I thought it would be a good idea. So tell me the RBI met in June and it maintained the repo rate but then it met again in August and cut it. What changed in the span of one month? The MPC met in early August and cut the interest rate from 6.25% to 6% so by 25 basis points. Uh nothing really changed in one month. Okay. But it's it's about trend. So uh, retail inflation, which is CPI, consumer mm-hmm. price index, has been s- falling steadily. And now in in uh, the June data, mm-hmm. it showed that it has actually fallen to one point five four percent, which is the lowest it has been in over a couple of decades, at least as far as I can remember. Okay. Uh, so that probably made them uh, cut the interest rates. And along with that, there are few other factors, uh, right. which is. um you have real interest rates in india uh, comparisons across real interest rates in the world will show that india has one of the highest real interest rates in the world so real interest rate by the way is just <laughs> yeah break it uh, down for a non economist and yeah, what's the real interest rate nominal interest rate that is the interest rate set by rbi okay. minus the inflation all right so in in india it's extremely high uh, and it's uh, probably the highest in 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 the world right now so that's probably also prompted them mm-hmm. and um, the other big factor is that industrial production has not been doing very well in india so uh, you have something called the index of industrial production which basically tells you how your manufacturing sector is doing mm. okay in in just a, a, a one line summary sort of thing and um, it is again been steadily falling and the latest figures which we have is probably for um, may and that was just about 1.7% in april it was 2. 8% and so on so there's been a steady decline so that's probably also something that prompted them to cut rates fair enough but india's growth rate is still about 7% right that's still healthy isn't it yeah give or take uh, whether it's healthy or not i would uh, give you an absolutely ambiguous answer in saying yes and no okay. uh, <laughs> now you'll have to tell me both yeah um it is one of the highest uh growth rate in the world that you can see so it it's in in comparison india is doing well but if you really look at the counterfactual i mean what could have been i would say that it would be much higher also important to look at the source of growth uh right so uh for example consumer expenditure and its contribution to growth has just been growing about 8% whereas uh government final consumption expenditure which is government uh, basically spending on for itself has been growing at 20% so it tells you that you know uh, uh, that the government is spending more than anyone else in the country and that is never a good sign and it's not sustainable for growth rates um just look at what's happening and that's the two sectors right consumers and the government and the third and the most important sector is the producers and that is where we are really really lacking behind so you can see and there are various uh, one is the iip that you i already told you about but there are also other proxies to kind of measure how the industry in 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 the country is doing and all of those indicators is quite you know dampening to say the least so for example there's a broad based loss in uh the speed of manufacturing in the country there's excess capacity in many of the industries uh there's excess capacity of coal usage of crude oil has fallen so all of these are indicators to tell you how manufacturing is doing and all of them paint quite a dismal picture to be honest okay so in that case if you what if what you're saying about manufacturing is true is just a cut of 25 basis points enough should it have been higher i think if you read the popular um present the commentary that came out after the RBI decision hmm. i think most of them had said that 25 basis is not enough some of them 
kind of cheered a 25 BPS cut, uh, while very few, I mean, handful of them said that there should have not been any cut at all. So obviously, you put two economists in a room and they disagree on four things, right? I, asking them just one question. So, um, but me personally, I, I don't think it should have been higher. Why so? Okay, I'm going to go back to the, the wisdom of the ages. There's this seminal paper by uh, Baynard, which actually argued that at any point of doubt, when there is uncertainty in the economy, monetary policy authorities should always err on the side of caution rather than this thing. So, yes, you have retail inflation at 1.54%. Mm. But some sort of analysts also say that it is largely because of a massive drop in vegetable and fruit prices. Uh, and general other pulses also has fallen. So, you know, how much of it is because of uh, such cyclical items, which, you know, you never know. Uh, tomato, by the way, when the data came out, tomato was rupees 20 a kg. Yeah. Uh, now it's about 100 rupees a kg. So if you go to the market right now, it'll, you'll come to know that vegetable prices have actually gone up again. Mm -hmm. So can you base long-term monetary policy decision based on short-term data? I really don't think you should. Uh, there is some science to say that, you know, there, there's been a structural... Uh, downtrend in, in terms of inflation uh, as measured by your core inflation or headline inflation, but it's still not um, enough to merit a bigger rate cut than what the RBI did. I think 25 basis points was just about right and largely that was done because the market expected. You know, it was kind of playing to the gallery. Uh, the market really wanted it. They were clamoring for it. And of course, you have a lot of pressure put in by uh, the finance ministry saying, you know, we would have had all this wonderful growth if the RBI had been a little bit more supportive. And, uh, you know, there's pressure from all corners. And when the MPC met, I think um, just one member of the MPC voted for uh, the rate staying exactly where it is, where everyone else rated, voted for a rate cut. And some of them voted for a 50 BPS rate cut. So the, the compromise was 25 basis points. Fair enough. But whenever we're talking about uh, the economy today, we talk about investment. So what does this rate cut do for investment? Will it spur it? Uh, no. <laughs> <All right>. Sorry. <laughs> Why not? Um, here, I mean, that that's, this is where I was getting at. Even if you had a 50 basis points hmm. uh, rate cut, you have to see whether it would have been effective in actually spurring investment. And hmm. my answer still would be no. Uh, because of some kind of structural flaws, and this probably is getting a bit into macroeconomics, but uh, let me just take a couple of minutes and talk to you about the monetary policy transmission coefficient. All right. Big words. Hit me. Okay. Uh, so, in essence, it just tells you about how effective a monetary policy decision is. Okay. Right? So, if the RBI cuts rate, by 50 basis points or even one percentage point, then what does it actually mean for those people who are actually borrowing? Does it translate uh, to a one percentage drop in people taking home loans or people taking auto loans or any other kind of loans, right? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, if the RBI cuts rate by one percent, the actual transmission that happens to the end consumer is probably quarter of that or half of that. And... Um, which which basically tells you that irrespective of what the RBI does, uh, there's actually very little effect on on you know the money supply in the economy, which is you know it 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 uh, puts a different perspective on monetary policy in India. Okay, but why is it weak? Why is your monetary transmission coefficient so weak? <laughs> right. Um, essentially, the two or three things, honestly, and. Um, one of the big things is quite a related topic and you would have heard about it as well is that the transmission i mean the the most banks in in commercial banks in india have huge npa problem which is non performing, non -performing assets, assets right yeah. they have a lot of stressed loans on their uh, on their assets so basically what this means is that if if the rbi cuts rates mm then banks will not be willing to actually make out new loans because they already have so many bad loans on their yeah. assets. So they don't want to, they're, they're in a position where they're extremely risk covers. They don't want to make new loans because of the fear that it'll turn into more NPAs. Yeah. And uh, they don't have that wiggle room to actually s cut down the rates and start lending out. So if you have a NPA problem in the economy, then the transmission coefficient will always tend to be weak and inefficient. So uh, that's one of the biggest problems why irrespective of what the RBI does, the banks will not cut the lending rate. So usually what would happen, right? And let me just tell you, and what I've heard is the RBI has to cut rates mm -hmm. and uh, banks don't follow that up with the rate cut of their own. That is, you know, their lending rates. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then it becomes inefficient. So then the finance minister will call the heads or chairpersons of some of the 
important PSU banks and literally arm twist them to cut down the rates, right? Which is usually first is the SBI because, you know, SBI is literally the second central bank in our economy. Uh, because, just because it acts as a, you know, bank to the, the central bank. So, uh, SBI will then... Force will be forced to cut their rates, uh, and then a few other PSUs will follow suit. But you know that's basically how the transmission works in India, not through the proper channels at all. So, is it the fault of the banks? Is it just that banks are unwilling to cut their lending rates, or what is the problem there? See, so you have a funny and ironic situation. On one hand, you have banks which is not willing to cut their lending rates, but equally, even if they did you wouldn't have as many borrowers. So you'd have, again, you know, retail uh, lending, which would happen, you know, mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. like you and me going and getting a loan, perhaps. But corporate borrowing wouldn't come forth. And the reason for that is a lot of corporates in India, again, have extremely stressed balance sheets. So uh, a lot of the corporates in India have, you know, stressed balance sheets. They have a lot of bad debt on their books, uh, which means that they're sitting on piles of cash actually a lot of corporates are sitting on piles of cash a lot of industries are sitting on piles of cash and they're not willing to spend it at all and uh, well the reasons for that are multiple right but what it means is that they are not willing to go and borrow more and use that for further investments right um, the investments will always come forth when you have trust in the economy when you think that the economy is going good and what you know Keynes said as the the animal spirits are you know are high. Uh, as of now, the animal spirits are low. People don't want to invest. Look at just one other thing. The number of stalled projects in India, again, is extremely high. So the project is started. Uh, they, the, these companies have money, but they're not willing to actually just see to the end of that project itself. Forget about start new ones. Right. So that also tells you that the investment climate in the country is, is not very conducive for, you know, uh, new investments and new uh, new big capex projects capital expenditure projects okay so anupam we've talked about a number of things but i'm yet to understand even the point of an inflation targeting system because you're you're saying you know uh, companies are stressed out banks are stressed out our growth is still like this manufacturing is going down so what is the point of an inflation targeting system yeah that's a good question um we we moved to the uh, this new thing of inflation targeting system quite recently in uh, about 2014 or 2015, uh, which is exactly when the MPC was formed as well. So uh, the RBI is now mandated mm -hmm. to keep inflation at 4% mm -hmm. and given a little, little bit of leeway in terms of plus or minus 2%. So the actual range is from 2 to 6%, mm -hmm. right? And uh, when that inflation, when we are not reaching that, then the RBI is actually accountable to parliament. Okay, so that's the inflation targeting system. So we have to keep inflation within that. Now, as I spoke, you know, monetary policy is not as efficient as it should be, hmm. right? Inflation targeting works when the decisions of the central bank actually percolate throughout the system and it achieves what it wants to achieve, yeah. right? And then you can keep inflation wherever you want it or at least attempt to do so. Uh, and it's worked reasonably well in New Zealand, for example. Bank of England has had its problems with inflation targeting and now we've tried it here. And I think just because the transmission coefficient is so weak, hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, the whole inflation targeting system kind of breaks down because uh, the RBI can cut rates or increase rates and then we're still not going to, you know, keep the target, right? You're going you're gonna to miss the target more often than not. Uh, that's on one side. But I think there's a bigger problem here uh, in terms of inflation targeting and that is the fiscal dominance of monetary policy. Okay. okay? I, th that This is the reason why I said it's going to be an unpopular podcast. But Yeah, but no, we need economists to break these things down for us. So, go. so the, the fiscal dominance of monetary policy just means that irrespective of what you know, the central bank does, uh, it can be overshadowed by what the state government and the central government does, right? So let's say you're, you're in a situation where you're trying to rein in expenditure. So you cut rate, uh, you know, you um, increase the rates and so on. And on the other hand, you'll have a central bank or a state bank doing farm loan waivers. Mm -hmm. So whatever monetary policy is doing, it'll get immediately overshadowed by the actions of central and state governments. And then the central and state governments will have to borrow from somewhere, right? And that usually comes from banks and the central bank itself. So it, it is quite a messy affair. And again, the inflation targeting works when uh, your central and state governments stick to their fiscal deficit targets. And if they don't do that, then, you know, monetary policy will always take a back seat. More than unpopular, I think uh, you're just pessimistic, Kanapam. You make me feel like our economy is a mess. Yeah, no, not really. Let me just remind you that we're still going at 7%.
Fair and enough. that's what everyone says to make everyone else feel happy in the at least in the policy circle so i'm just going to leave you with that as well though it's it's we've still got a long way to go i mean i think there's uh, niranjan who wrote uh, this really good piece about you know how do you have to focus on jobs and uh, if not we'll be more like latin america like, uh, if rather not than southeast asia. asia yeah exactly yeah. so uh, there are a lot of things which are quite dismal out there but uh, yeah I, this is just about the monetary policy <laughs> all right so i'm going to go far away from what we're talking about what i've been reading about over the last uh, couple of weeks is what's happening in pakistan so i don't know if you've heard but the pakistan prime minister nawaz sharif was uh, dismissed from office after corruption charges and uh, a lot of people were like okay good you know people are getting dismissed on charges of corruption this is a victory for democracy let me get this straight yet another prime minister pakistani prime minister has been ousted it's not really new is it because you've had uh, what what's the statistic no single prime minister of pakistan has ever completed a full term so what's exactly new here i mean why are you getting all excited about this okay i'm not excited about this but i found it really interesting because it's not a military coup in the traditional sense that we've witnessed before in the past in pakistan it's a judicial coup oh. or that's what a lot of analysts are saying okay what does that mean then so uh Nawaz Sharif was dismissed um using article 62 and 63 of the Pakistani constitution. Wait, Pakistan has a constitution? <laughs> yes, and article 62 and 63 requires members of the Pakistan uh, government to uphold two qualities, uh truthfulness or sadiq and righteousness or ameen. And at the end of the day, it was just fascinating to see the charges on which he was dismissed right truthfulness like really can you imagine a single indian uh, minister who would be kept in office if we dismissed them all on the same terms hey dk shiv kumar <laughs> Okay, that's all I'll say. No, I'm not. I'm not going down that road. Uh, but something that TCA Raghavan pointed out is that it's interesting to see the role of judiciary in eroding democracy. Uh, it's not new because even this stretches back to the 1950s. Oh, but over the last few years, the judiciary in Pakistan became a little more robust, which is why this was uh, a little more surprising. So even Aisha Siddiqui was writing in Scroll, and she was saying maybe this is a new phase. is in pakistani politics where we no longer look at military coups but maybe we'll be witnessing more judicial coups article 62 and 64 of the pakistani constitution is all really interesting i'm sure but uh, what i'd like to hear about is how did a single font which is calibri get a prime minister of a supposed democratic government ousted fair enough font gate as it's popularly known uh, be- became a huge thing so what happened is that the joint investigation team that was set up found uh, that uh, nawaz sharif and his three children hussein uh, hasan and maryam sharif his political heir uh, all of them were guilty of setting up shell companies that were then used to buy property uh, in course. london so uh, which was undeclared and uh, this is just one of the other charges but one uh, the documentation that mariam presented uh, to convince the team of her uh, trueness was done in calibri font but the problem is that the uh, documents were from 2006 oh. and calibri as a font was only released publicly in 2007 and, and it's that tiny small detail that gave it all away that's what brought all of it down but uh, yeah which is why it's interesting but there are questions uh, about this joint investigation team as well because you know it had uh, members from the pakistan army it had members from the pakistan intelligence so there are a lot of unanswered questions about you know why the investigation was conducted and why sharif was even dismissed right because he was going to be the first prime minister of pakistan who ever completed a full term by the end of the year so close yet so far this but this reminds me i know I, as a cricket fan right this reminds me of uh, let's say inzam ul haq getting caught for obstructing the field or you know falling over his wickets actually that is the image the former captain of pakistan cricket team actually f- tried to sweep a shot lost his balance fell on his own wicket uh, the font gate somehow reminds me of that i don't know why there's no clear connection but that's what it reminds me of uh, fair enough but so an other cricketer is now you know the, the favorite to win the 2018 elections uh, imran khan imran khan fantastic bowler uh, 
that might be so <laughs> but imran khan's also going to be subject to this it doesn't mean that you know democracy is any more robust or the military is going to stop playing its hand within a civilian government uh but what's interesting with all of this anupam is first why sharif got dismissed uh because a lot of people were saying it's because of the don leaks it's because uh he had close connections to india is what hussein hakani said in a hindu article uh and a lot of people were talking about the fact that he was taking credit for cpec or uh, things that the pakistan army wasn't really fond of um and what were worried about i guess is how is it going to affect things in india what is going to happen to the military jihadi comp complex what's going to happen to kashmir is violence going to be on an upsurge is it going to decrease these are the things that we'll have to watch out for yeah now. depends on who comes to power next true and whether they use times new roman <laughs> <laughs> i mean just stick to times new roman right so we will recommend adopting times new roman as standard font for governments everywhere and that's it for the first half of today's episode thanks anupam for breaking down inflation for us oh my pleasure we'll be back in the second half with saurabh chandra to talk about I- the it industry and job cuts are you confused about your future education options not sure about whether you should be doing an mba or if design school is the right fit for you are you worried about how you would finance your education find answers to this and a lot more education related topics on this podcast Hi, my name is Akhil Aswani. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OnCourse. Hi, my name is Alisha Mashrawala. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OnCourse. And we both are your co-hosts for the OnCourse podcast. Tune in every Monday on the IVM podcast app or any other podcast app you may like. Welcome back to the Pragati podcast. I'm Hamsni Hariharan and I'm now joined by Saurabh Chandra. Saurabh is a technology entrepreneur. Before his current venture where he's now making self-driving vehicles, he ran an IT services company for more than 10 years that was later acquired by a global major. Welcome to the show, Saurabh. Thanks so much for inviting me, Anthony. So since the beginning of the year there have been reports of massive layoffs in the information technology or IT industry. So for example in May the top 7 IT companies were supposedly planning to lay off 56000 employees and the issue even came up in the last session of the parliament about you know what is the government doing to protect the interests of the workers but let's get to the base of this IT is one of the engines of India's growth is it imploding in short my answer would be no um and and here's here's the long answer uh to that i mean the it industry has had many deaths foretold i mean the it industry grew famously in the y2k scare uh in y2k? the late uh y2k as in year 2000 okay right so so there was this uh y2k bug where the date formats were only two digits mm-hmm. and it worked well when we were in the 1900s okay. but suddenly when you were moving in the 2000s the dates had to be changed to the format had to be otherwise you could not distinguish between 1902 and 2002 oh wow okay so that was a big uh, uh, a big uh, problem to be solved and it needed a lot of people it was supposedly low end work which required massive amount of uh, labor force to fix it and that was kind of a golden opportunity where indian it industry came into its being uh, but the thinking was that once the y2k scare is over i mean you've entered 2000 so mm-hmm. thing if things are working now they are working what would those massive amounts of people do and this is a very short term industry we are making hay while the sun shines in the late 90s and that's about it but then the internet came and a lot of indian companies were able to evolve from low end work of doing y2k projects to doing internet services or in general other enterprise it work because they had already formed relationships with customers etc and that happened but then the era of uh, saas which is software as a service companies started people thought well now large enterprise deployments in enterprises is no longer required mm-hmm. and most of it uh, companies i mean the the big work that it uh, companies do is customize products for enterprises mm-hmm. so so product is a software which is built once then used many times uh but we use consumer products and all of our needs are pretty much similar you don't customize for example your ms word yeah fair enough <laughs> but when a uh, enterprise company takes a product say like an sap which is uh, enterprise resource planning hmm. software it requires massive customizations for their own business context yes 
And that massive customization is typically done by IT services companies. But when the era of SaaS companies came in, people thought, well, this work will die soon. SaaS is what exactly? Software as a service. Oh, all right. Right. So SaaS companies, people thought that this is uh, this is now going to kill probably the IT services companies again. But uh, and and then similarly, cloud came later on. Uh, the whole era of digital and and automation has come in. Across all those deaths foretold, uh, the IT industry has uh, grown from something like ten twenty billion dollars to currently a hundred and twenty roughly billion dollars in exports. Okay, so you're one of the few people who thinks that these fears are unfounded then. Uh, absolutely. In fact, I would think that most of these are opportunities. Um, uh, I mean, technology trends keep changing. Uh, currently, a lot of uh, technology, new technologies have come to the fore, especially in the machine learning and AI space. In general, also software productivity has been increasing rapidly. I mean, now that we have been doing software for 20, 30 years now as a, as an industry, not only as India, there are now a lot of frameworks, a lot of libraries which help you do. I mean, if you were doing a, a web application in 2000, mm. to, do a something, to do something similar, say, in 2017 would be probably one twentieth of the effort. Okay, just because of reusability and better processes, better uh, better understanding of how software should be done, we are way more productive. So you're saying that this is a result of the fact that the industry has matured? In, yeah, absolutely. Industry has matured and there are new things which are coming in. And I see, uh, I, I mean, I would be worried if the churn was not happening in the industry. This What this shows is that the industry is very cognizant of the changes and it's trying to adapt. So if it's trying to adapt, what are the new venues? You said artificial intelligence was mm-hmm. one, right? Mm-hmm. So how does that turn up? So now, uh, I mean, uh, Google and Facebook, etc. have been at the forefront of AI and machine learning for many years now, uh, Google especially. But now the artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies have also matured to an extent where they are commoditized. I mean, uh, there are libraries, packages available. And, and what IT services companies are very good at, they're not so good at creating new technology. Their primary strength is in understanding their customer and applying their business context uh, and finding the technology and marrying the business context to the technology. That's what they are good at. And now AI, machine learning technologies have also evolved to an extent where the, the product companies have created those technologies, but somebody needs to marry those technologies to the business context of end customers. Okay, and so you're saying the Indian IT industry can do that? Will do it. Will do it. So, But does this mean that you know the Indian techies will only do low-end jobs? Sure. So, so uh, e- even even let's see how AI and machine learning uh, technologies ha- currently operate. Uh, most of the times, there is, as the term itself says, machine learning. I mean, AI is a broad term, which also means that maybe we are trying to create artificial sentient life, etc. So, this is not about that. So, most we're not of, going to get into the singularity debate no, today. Then. No, this is not. I mean, and that's not what most of the industry is trying to do. Most of the industry is trying to take those techniques, learnings, which started off trying to mimic the human brain. Uh, But we have uh, have kind of deviated from that in many places. And what we are trying to do is, I think, be inspired from how the human brain works, but then apply those learnings to solve very specific problems. So you are trying to make, for example, a a machine learning algorithm, which is very good at detecting faces. Mm. And, uh, And that's all it does. It's not as if the face detection algorithm will start also producing sports content, which also, by the way, machine learning algorithms are very good at. Most likely the sports news that you're reading, you read today morning was written by a computer. So, wow, okay. <laughs> so machines have become very good at taking because you have enough data from the match which has come in and mm. you can tie it in a narrative which is pre- which is obvious and, and it can do it. But usually you train something for one thing. Mm. The chess playing algorithm which Deep Blue used was not used by the AlphaGo uh, <laughs> algorithm which uh, Google used to, for example, play win the Go game. Hmm. So they're very specific targeted. Now, now coming to the face recognition example, because I think that's easier to relate to. Yeah. So now if there is an algorithm which, for example, does face recognition, the huge amount of work involved with tweaking, adapting the algorithm and training the algorithm. So there's a lot of data collection which is required. There's a lot of training which, has to, which is required. And 
face is probably are more similar all over the world but for example coming to self driving cars i mean you need to understand road signs so you may build a algorithm which which reads road signs but then there's lot of work required to read road signs in various different geographies yeah and even countries right countries and languages hmm. and as it industry has always done i think first it will pack at the lower end of that spectrum hmm. where uh, i mean there might be a 200 people team trying to do road sign detection somewhere hmm. the core people who would be doing the algorithm probably would be five hmm. there will be 195 people who would be trying to train the algorithm tweak it test it okay. and a whole lot of stuff and that's probably job uh, very well done in indian it services companies All right. Uh, I'm just going to bring in the role of the U.S. when we're talking about this. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, a lot of these jobs are expected to come from the U.S., which is where a lot of these companies are based out of. That's right. Um, and a lot of the fear about job losses came from the fact that the U.S. is being more protectionist and so mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, do you think that the root of all of this is that the U.S. is becoming more protectionist, which is why we have job losses in India? I wouldn't think so. I mean, the U.S. protect. I mean, U.S. government has its limitations. Hmm. it can't prevent offshoring as much as it can prevent uh, it can probably uh, hurt the visa regime a little bit so travel becomes a little more difficult uh, people can't go on site and work in in the us i think initially it was very important in the previous 20 years probably a lot of people needed to travel go, but today communication technologies are becoming better every day you could you can do voice conferences from your mobile phone in india now compared to i mean having to sit in an office with a lot of infrastructure i think some of this will be balanced by just having better communication now Uh, you still need to go and meet people for on business visas which has not been clamped down because you need to still have discussions close uh, deals uh, and and indian it companies have been pretty smart at also hiring in the us so for the work that needs to be done in us there is no reason why indian companies couldn't hire there okay fair which enough. will put some uh, pressure on their margins yeah. but which is fair game i think a lot of the especially the very large indian it services companies mm-hmm. operate with very high margins i think they are not going to die if it's going to reduce a little bit <laughs> fair enough um just when coming to offshoring right can you explain to me what the sinking ladder phenomenon is because mm-hmm. you'd spoken about it earlier as well sure so i mean for example taking just the example of the ai example earlier mm-hmm. where we discuss I mean, or or even the y2k example that we spoke about a lot of people thought especially in the us that well all we are going to do is outsource the lower end jobs to india and uh, most of the meaty work will keep getting done in the us kind of like how they had done with manufacturing earlier hmm. most of the design work kept happening in the us and you only uh, did assembly le- assembly worker kind of jobs were offshored hmm. and and people thought the knowledge industry is very analogous hmm. and that's where people were taking inspiration from but that turned out to be false in the knowledge industry for, for a knowledge worker to graduate from one tier to the other tier is much more easier so you would imagine that well i am giving the bottom most work uh, so sort of if i have a corporate ladder i took the bottom most ladder uh, and and put that in india rest of everything was happening in the us mm. but well guess what the person who was at the bottom most ladder there works for a couple of years it has to be promoted after some time because he has become more experienced doing yeah. su- stuff he knows how to do more stuff and he gets promoted so he goes to the next ladder below him is another person hired for the job that he was doing hmm. now instead of one person you have two people and this keeps happening year after year and people and that's happened now with many companies in india where over 20 30 years they have risen right to the top of the ladder hmm. so we've built a lot of expertise in the knowledge economy yes. absolutely i mean in 30 years now i mean and it's become so mature that people have built competitors to the parent companies in india they have been able to take up the complete business context uh, understand it and also in many areas i mean i i was not very charitable where i said no, it services company is not very good at making technologies which they're not very good at but doesn't mean they have never done it i mean they've d- developed excellent technologies in many many areas but that's not the large part of what they do okay fair enough so uh, which brings me to a slightly different topic because you're also a technology entrepreneur this is great for innovation in india right um i mean at the end of the day um the new technologies are great yeah uh, they, which are coming hmm. so i mean the fact that it is faster cheaper hmm. uh, to develop stuff to solve problems is a great thing but i would not discount the fact that i mean if you look at it from a perspective of the person losing his job mm. i mean that pain is real mm. 
okay i mean the people who are so there are certain technologies which are going out of fashion there are new ones which are coming in and in the churn there are people if you see the it industry as a whole is still hiring the total net job additions in the it industry are supposed to be close to 150000 this year okay so it's, it's still the largest private employer right um totally the it services com- industry in india hires roughly 3 million people hmm. i don't know what the compare i think railways itself hires something like okay. 1.5 or right. right so i wouldn't think uh, as an industry large. it might hmm. be the largest i think hmm. textiles or okay. other places hmm. would be hiring uh, if you probably add up the income that this 3 million people generate might be a very high number though, hmm. because all of them are uh, pretty well paid hmm. uh, but the overall number is roughly 3 million okay. i mean just forced attrition every year if you think that companies are trying to uh, take out bottom 3% every year or something comes to roughly 100000 people and in, i would expect that number to be maybe double when in an era of churn that's like 200,000 people i mean the absolute numbers have become big so they sometimes grab headline but this is something which would be happening pretty much every year okay but then there's also the question of you know this uh, unceremonious termination right so a company is being you know empathetic enough to the employees that laying off i mean especially some of the cases that we heard about recently i think it is uh, it's pretty apparent that they are not uh empathy uh, it industry has been uh, the employers uh, the it services companies and the employees have had a very uh, how should i put it uneasy relationship over the past many years uh, uh most of the times employees have also been very unfaithful to companies and vice versa hmm. when the going has been good people have taken up offers not joined at the last minute not served notice periods uh left the company's projects midway and when the company has figured out well there is this technology which is going out of fashion there's a new one coming in instead of trying to uh, invest in retraining people many companies have chosen to fire the full division which is uh, in the legacy technologies and hire completely new set of people in the new technology so as a overall industry maybe there are more net jobs but uh, possibly more retooling and retraining could have happened hmm. it would have meant more cost uh, for the company but that culture is is not very uh, prevalent yeah perhaps it's because as indians we have such a paternalistic attitude towards uh, an expectation probably uh, but i i don't know i mean india has not had so in the manufacturing space these things are very common hmm. uh, but i think those expectations and relationships happen over time uh, people join a company and then expect that company to take care of them till they retire somehow that culture has not formed in the it industry for good or for bad i hmm. mean as of now it has helped because it also helps uh, costs are low people re- people the i would say the onus of retooling and uh, relearning has been put on the pers- person and the individual so it's a little non paternalistic environment in that sense as of now companies say well if you need to and there's a lot of and if you see there's a lot of uh, Uh, training and retooling industry in in India also where people go and and a lot of people actually do it on their own hmm. rather than waiting for the companies to do it maybe overall as a as a sector that is better because people know best what they are good at rather than a company trying to figure out what everybody is good at hmm. yeah but i guess we see like the human side of it yeah, um, yeah. so, uh, so, so some of the tragedies are real i hmm. i wouldn't discount that but i don't know what's the what's the solution right now Fair enough. I'm just uh, wondering, what does it mean this churn in information technology? What does it mean for the Indian economy on a whole? I think economy as a whole is still doing well. I mean, if the exports are increasing, uh, so th- but they have slowed. The growth has slowed. That is sure. Which I I think might be fair expectation at this stage. Do we expect a industry which was going from maybe twenty to hundred billion dollar to have been growing at whatever fifteen twenty percent? Now it's a hundred billion dollar plus industry. Would it grow at the same rate? no so so it's probably unfair to expect the same rate of growth that was there earlier in the it services industry because the base is much larger uh, but yeah so that's that's what my guess would be okay uh, just one last question sir what do you think uh, would be the smart move that it companies should make now mm-hmm. and what do you think that uh, techies should do now to make themselves more relevant in a market 
So, uh, uh, answer for both of them is the same. I mean, uh, go and embrace machine learning and AI like anything. I think that's the future. Uh, the world is moving towards that. There is no reason why Indian companies and Indian techies should not uh, adopt that faster uh, than uh, than later. And we have, uh, ex- I mean, we have excellent opportunities in solving problems which could be relevant more to our context. But people should not be limited by that. You can build global companies out of India. I mean, there's no reason the information is available everywhere and that's what you are working with so there's no reason why we should not be able to compete with uh, other players and i think this will accelerate overall the reach of information technology in general on the problems that it has been attacking so the number of problems spaces that we were attacking will become larger so the industry as a whole once it adapts will grow it will not shrink because of this. There will be more and more things that we will be doing, uh, which has happened time and again. As cost of each thing goes down, cloud has increased the adoption of information technology, not mm-hmm. reduced it. Uh, so uh, this famous saying, software is eating the world and that eating has not stopped as yet. So we are still, software is going into multiple domains and verticals and making, taking a bigger and bigger shares of those verticals. And some of that share should come to the Indian IT industry and the Indian economy. Okay, so Bangalore techies are going to be very happy with our podcast today, I think. But uh, thank you so much, Saurabh, for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, that's it for this episode of the Pragati Podcast. You can listen to the Pragati Podcast on the IBM Podcast app or any other podcast app that you prefer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Sorry to say, but there's been a slight delay due to the apocalypse having suddenly begun. As you can see, there's death, destruction and chaos taking place all around us. But don't you worry, food and drinks will be served shortly and I would recommend checking out IVM Podcasts to get some of your favorite Indian podcasts. We'll keep you going till this whole thing blows over. Thank you.